hppodcraft.com. Welcome to HP Podcraft, the HP Lovecraft literary podcast. I'm Chris Lackey. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. And uh, we are here to talk about the works, the very specific works of H.P. Lovecraft. That's right. H.P. Uh, Lovecraft is a famous author in the 20th century. He wrote a lot of horror and science fiction stories, what were called at the time weird fiction. Weird and fiction. And what we'd like to do, we're both huge fans. We're not scholars. We're not scholars. We're not... Uh, well, Chad has, his, Chad has his degree in uh, English literature, I believe. True, but I didn't take a single class about H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> yes, and I have... Uh, I've, I'm actually illiterate and can't... No, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> I, I've, I've just, I'm just a, a fan. And uh, an That's amateur, right. an amateur scholar, I guess you could say. Yeah. So what we want to do here is uh, each week cover one of the stories of H.P. Lovecraft, talk about maybe its larger relevance, what was going on in the story, yep. what we liked about it, what, and you know what we think it, uh, if we think it advanced the, the yes. genre of All, weird fiction. Also, uh, criticisms. We'll talk about criticisms of those particular stories by right. um, different scholars and people that are just into H.P. Lovecraft. We will, at the end of the episode, this particular episode, we'll tell you what we're going to study uh, the next episode so you can read it. And if you don't feel like reading it, uh, you can just listen to the podcast and you'll probably know all you need to know about it and you could fake it to yeah, your friends exactly. and pretend so that you did read it. It will make you much more popular yes. among almost any group of people to know a lot <laughs> about H.P. Lovecraft. So... I Think of this, if not, as a way to indulge some of your literary hobbies, but also to make friends. Yes. And uh, become cool. It's true. Yeah. Um, basically, we, I think Chad and I both picked up all women that we've ever dated in our entire life using HP Love. Yeah. It's, it's basically, that's how I get in. I yep. go, well, think of the name, Lovecraft. Absolutely. When you, that's really, when you read and you know about HP Lovecraft, eventually you will be able to execute Lovecraft. Yeah, exactly. I don't know what I'm talking about. Why don't, why don't we... Uh... So on this first episode, um, since we haven't set it up with the story yet, we figured we should just talk about H.P. Lovecraft, a general overall view of the man. So, uh, concisely, who H.P. Lovecraft is, he was, a, as I said before, an early 20th century writer. He was uh, born in 1890, and he died, I think, in the late 30s. 37. And he wrote supernatural fiction and science fiction stories, which at the time were called weird, weird, weird fiction. fiction. Uh, he wasn't quite recognized in his lifetime, but he's gone on to be a huge influence. You know, Stephen King has acknowledged him as the 20th century's Clive greatest Bar master. Clive Barker. Uh, uh, you'll see his influence in all sorts of literary and film and, and TV endeavors. Yep. He sort of created a mythology that most of his stories are set in. Yeah. About uh, the things that he, he had a, his, his worldview, that kind of a through line in all of his stories, is that there are these aliens slash gods that exist out in the universe and they're pretty malevolent and there is no nice sweet you know loving god that exists out in the universe it's just these things and that we as humans are kind of uh, alone and and uh it's pretty bleak <laughs> yeah it's bleak and it's horrifying and and it's it's quite different than other horror writers and what they usually address he did not write about werewolves or vampires no he did not write about ghosts no uh, it was never about trying to get control over a supernatural world and eventually succeeding by learning about it. No, it was uh, the opposite. It was the opposite, which is that the more you uncover and the more you know, the crazier you go. Yeah. Because the more you realize that humans are completely insignificant as yes. far as the, the cosmos goes. We really don't matter. And, and if there's any logic behind why we're all here or what the cosmos is about, it's an insane logic that you could never possibly understand. Yeah, no. The more you do understand it, the more insane you yourself will go. Well, a lot of his stories, I mean, are based, um, they, tell, they tell about ancient races that once lived on Earth that had great civilizations that died out. It's kind of him acknowledging, hey, you know what, we've got this great civilization, but guess what? It's only temporary. All things have a beginning and an end, and our time will end. Exactly. And a lot of people call this the Cthulhu mythos. Yes. The reason they call it that is because Cthulhu, uh, which we say Cthulhu, it's supposed to be an unpronounceable kind of name. Yeah, it's that, like Cthulhu. <laughs> that's as close as we can get to it, is basically a Godzilla kind of figure. It's a giant monster that sleeps down in the bottom of the ocean. Well, Not, I, I, yeah. I'm trying to make it relatable. Okay, like, sure, sure, sure. It's sure. a giant tentacled monster that lives down in yeah, the ocean. Yeah, it's like hundreds of feet tall. It's down there sleeping. Eventually, it's going to rise up out of the ocean and just devastate huge portions of the planet, yeah. right? Is that correct? Uh -huh, yeah. And uh, all of these other characters that are related to that are all tied up in this thing called the Cthulhu mythos that he wrote stories 
was in, and he was a, a correspondent with a number of other literary figures at the time, probably most famously Robert Block, who wrote Psycho, who was yeah. just a teenager when Lovecraft yeah. wrote to him. Robert E. Howard, who did the Conan novels. He just, he shared this whole mythos that he created, which I think is in contrast to a lot of literary figures like Tolkien, who right. um, who didn't necessarily share Middle Earth with other people. Yeah, other people didn't write stories that took place in Middle Earth. And right. I think that it, you know, it connects with the online culture now where people are writing fan fiction in worlds that they like. They they feel, right. you know, if you watch the show, I don't know, any science fiction show, you watch Quantum Leap or Lost or <laughs> Star Trek, yeah. people feel like, hey, I put a lot of time and effort into this and I own it too and I want to be a part of it and I want to tell stories in that yeah. genre. And H.P. Lovecraft really encouraged that, which is why I think when we're working on our projects now, um, it never feels like sacrilege. It never feels like we're doing anything wrong with the properties that he created. No. Because he encouraged people to use it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, whether or not he would actually enjoy it. No, I think that, that he we... would hate most of the stuff that we're doing. Yeah, probably, but, yeah. Uh, but he would encourage it at least. Uh, but why is H.P. Lovecraft personally relevant to you? Personally relevant to me? I mean, when, you, when did you have your first connection with uh, this author? I would have to say it was with the, really with the role-playing game. And... It now, was, a role-playing game is a game where you, you make up characters. Yeah, you make you up sort characters. Of play scenarios you sit at a world. table. Mm -hmm. um, some people dress up and, and do things, which uh, you know, I'm all into. But, but typically, when I was younger, all I did was uh, we sit at a table. A bunch of people would make up their own characters. One person would be in charge, and he would say what was going on in the story, and mm -hmm. you would make decisions just for your character. So it was sort of... It, like Dungeons and Dragons, exactly. except instead of that fantasy world, it was in the early 20th century world of H.P. Lovecraft. Yes. Gotcha. And this idea of of a universe that is really dark, that there is no hope, that there is no heaven, there is no afterlife, there, these gods and things don't, God doesn't exist. There's just these horrible monsters that are going to, you know, hopefully you'll die before you ever have to deal with them. But if you ever have to deal with these things, your sanity will be shattered and you'll see your entire world destroyed. Yeah. And that was cool to me. Like, I was so um, different. It was, it, I've never read anything like that. Mm -hmm. And like, like you were saying before, usually supernatural stories are about people learning to understand them and then overcome them. And this is, you're never going to overcome this and you're never going to understand it and you're better off not knowing these yeah, things. Yeah, you're better off being ignorant. But that's, it's kind of interesting because, you know, this is when Einstein and, you know, the scientific quantum quantum theory and all these things were starting to come out. Mm -hmm. And Lovecraft himself, a big astronomy buff, would study these things. And these are the feelings that he would get. It would right. be like, I can't even begin to fathom how big the universe is. Yeah, it reminds me of when on. I was a, a little kid. I remember I would lay awake at night thinking about infinity. I mean... The universe goes on infinitely. That means it never ends. So it is that concept alone was blowing my little young mind. And I remember telling my dad that and having him say, don't think about those things because it'll drive you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that was his answer. But uh, and, and that's, I think, why H.P. Lovecraft's, you know, modus operandi kind of touched me or, or uh -huh. I was interested in because it's all about how the, the universe is crazy and random. And uh -huh. I, I know that in my young life, it wasn't necessarily that hard, but it wasn't great. And a lot of things would come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And I had no control over them. Yeah. And when I read H.P. Lovecraft, it appealed to me because he really had an understanding of that fear that any given day, you know. Anything can happen. Anything could happen. And, and you can't control it. No. And, and the more you know about it, the more sick you get. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, which, uh, in which I think that a lot of... Um, I, you could call them nerds or nerd culture. A lot of people who are fans of H.P. Lovecraft are people who maybe didn't feel like they had a lot of control in their life right. at certain periods. Right. When you have trouble dealing with society, I think mm -hmm. it's easy to want to think that it doesn't matter. Like it's mm -hmm. not important because you're not doing a good job in, this, in, in society. Right. You're not being successful. And a good defense for that, whether, I mean, not good, but a defense for that is that, you know what? All that stuff is bullshit. It yeah. doesn't mean anything. It doesn't matter. <laughs> He lived, you know, he, he didn't well, get Let's talk much. about his, his life. So he, he was... Uh... His family was somewhat wealthy uh, when he first, when he was a, a young child. Uh, his dad was a traveling salesman who went uh, insane mm -hmm. when he was very young and was institutionalized. Which must have been horrible. Uh, probably. But he was very young. He was like three years he old. He was like three years old when and his And what dad drove his dad insane? Was it having such a sissy nerd kid? Or... Uh, it was probably the nerd kid that, <laughs> that ticked him. No. It, um... What I read is that he just went, he had a psychotic episode in a hotel room in Chicago, and then that was the end of it. He it was, was catatonic after that. It was the syphilis. 
and we think it was the syphilis. We think it was the syphilis. Okay. I mean, from, you know, historically speaking, it mm -hmm. seems like it was the syphilis. He was a traveling salesman. You do the math. Okay. Uh, let me let me get a pencil and do the math. Do the math right there. Um, <laughs> ah, yep. It's the syphilis. It's the syphilis. Okay. Uh, so he ended up living with his maternal grandfather, mm -hmm. uh, Whipple Van Buren Phillips, mm -hmm. and his mother and his two aunts, which I believe are his mom's sisters. Right. So he uh, he was surrounded by all of these women. Women. Uh, and his grandfather, as as I understand it, encouraged his literary efforts, gave him. Uh, books and yes. actually it's just like how i discovered hp lovecraft my uncle who was the only one handing me books and encouraging me gave me a copy of the case of charles dexter ward which was the first thing that right. i read so you know good for him that he had somebody like that in his life although i don't think grandpa was around he wasn't okay no he died in 1904 so oh, okay. he was 14 he was so old. he was around for a while but in those early early years lovecraft actually didn't go to school no because he was too sick or at least he was pretending to be too sick yeah they said he was you know, often argumentative at school and would have problems just dealing with people right. uh, but he was really into science he he studied astronomy when he was like nine years old he wrote periodicals like a little sci the scientific gazette in mm -hmm. uh in 1899 so yeah he was nine so he was mostly self-educated he read the books that his grandfather gave mm -hmm. him and he avoided school i think until around high school when he, yeah. he actually did attend and uh and so he had a rough early life now one thing that i've read or at least i've heard a lot and you can tell me if this is crazy. I know his mother was institutionalized later. Yes. But a lot of people told me that she dressed him like a little girl when he was a kid. Yes. Okay. Here's the thing. In the turn of the century, uh, boys and girls were dressed, little boys and girls were dressed in dresses. Like, that's just how it was. Everybody was? Everybody was. They would have little frilly outfits. When you were a baby, you wore, you know, little dresses. Like, that's just it. Like, mm. I've seen pictures of, you know, I think my great-grandfather has a little dress on. If you go back, look at any really? old pictures of long, young little, like little kids. Okay, so let me ask you, was that a common thing in the 70s? Uh, no. Oh, okay. But, but both of his parents were nuts. I mean, that's, that's safe. Yeah, his mom, there was a lot, uh, supposedly his mom was very uh, critical of him, but also very affectionate to him. Mm -hmm. And there was, some people say, which I don't necessarily agree with, because um, it seems pretty tenuous, the is that she kind of had some weird fetish for her son. Not that anything ever happened, but right. she kind of doted over him. And Was that normal at the time? And no. Uh, <laughs> and dressed, dressed him up in her in her husband's clothes. You know, when he got old enough, he like wore his... Oh, wow. Which I think, they were poor. Like, yeah. Even though his family was wealthy, this is what happened when his grandfather passed away, which when he was 14, and that was something that was devastating to him, because mm -hmm. that was kind of his father figure. Right. Uh, they mismanaged... The money was mismanaged. So when his when his grandfather died, they became poor and they had to move out of the like his childhood home. Oh right, and it into a much smaller, a much smaller place, mm -hmm. and that you know really gave him some problems. He was suicidal at the time. Like right. you know, it was, it was a big issue. What got him really into writing? Okay, is there was this amateur, like an amateur movement that was mm -hmm. kind of going on. He would write letters into magazines and kind of critique stories. Like he hated the stupid romantic stories that were going on at the time. Mm -hmm. And he sort of got recognized as this guy who wrote letters and critiques. And so he kind of hooked up with a um, an amateur group, which mm -hmm. were these just group of writers, and they would do like self publications and things like that. Mm -hmm. This whole time, though, he didn't. He never graduated high school either, right. uh, because he came close, but he bombed out. Yeah, he just kind of went a little nuts. Yeah. Some people theorize that he had problem with math, like right. mathematics was an issue for him. So he, um, so he got into writing through the Amateur Association, yes. and he probably, w when, when did he start getting published? 1917 okay. was when the tomb <clears throat> was written. And All I right, so from written. 1917 on, he was writing pretty regularly. No. And then he... No, actually he wasn't. No? He was not a very regular writer. He wasn't even making his living at it. He didn't really start doing a bulk of his work until... Until much later. Until much later. And now, when he, um, when he became older, he got married, right? He did, uh, but that wasn't until after his mom died. And his mom died when okay. he was 31. It was 21, 1921. So yeah, he would be 31 when his mom died. And then he quickly hooked up with somebody. Okay. Sonia Green is this woman that he married. She's seven years older than him. She's seven years older Maybe than him. Maybe it's some replacement for his mother. Could be. Maybe he dressed her up in his mother's clothes, because that's what he learned. Uh, that is pure speculation on your pure part. Pure speculation, but you heard it here first. After that happened, uh -huh. he they move so he moves to New York with this with this woman. Yes, and she owns a hat shop out there. Yes, and Lovecraft can't get any work. No, so he's hanging out in the apartment, kind of moping around, mm -hmm. you know, 
Whether he can't, can't get people. work or doesn't want to yeah, get work. Yeah, we're not sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're in Brooklyn, and and things are a little rocky. Her hat shop goes under, and so she has to leave to go find some work. Yeah, she, she kind of leaves him alone in New York. And he's alone in, in New York, and that's when he wrote the screenplay for Crooklyn, I think. No? I think no, uh, okay. Home Alone Two is what oh, you're okay. thinking. Yeah. None of that happened. But he he was in he was in Brooklyn alone. He hated New York, and some people think you know, a lot of people criticize Lovecraft because he was something of a racist. Yes, uh, and they think that a lot of that came from his time in New York when he was dealing with a very ethnic population. Yes, that he disliked, and he was from a small you know Providence, obviously a much different vibe than New York City. Right, and and he really had a hard time dealing with that, and a lot of times. His racism is rather inconsistent because his his wife was Jewish, even though right. he would complain about uh, foreigners, Jewish mm-hmm. people, whatever. And know. a lot of that might have been part of his affectation, which is that he, you know, he was an Anglophile. Even the way he writes, it sounds like you know he's somebody from England a hundred years before he was alive. I right. mean, he very much so had this. Um, he called himself grandfather, I think, sometimes when he wrote to people in letters, even though he was, you know, in his 30s. Yeah, I did. Um, he just sort of wanted to be an old European all the time. <laughs> right. And I think part of that might have been, you know, yeah. played into his racism and his feeling that other cultures were yeah, not. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it was a different period. A different, yeah. like, it's, uh, as much as I, I, I hate to, like, give people a pass on that, like, right, you right. just have to, I mean. It wasn't a huge part of his work. There's no. some descriptive things sometimes in stories where you can tell that maybe he doesn't like right. Uh, the, some the other horror races. of Red Red Hook, which was the neighborhood he lived mm-hmm. in Brooklyn when he wrote the story, it's pretty heavily. You can tell that he has some racist feelings right. about stuff. But, but ultimately, he kind of thought everybody was horrible. Oh right, yeah, <laughs> at he, core, he, he hated everyone. Lineage, right. He hated people in general. Now, after that time in Brooklyn, I think his marriage sort of fell apart, and he wound up moving back to Providence yes. to live with his aunts. And that was those sort of last 10 years of his life where he was super productive. Right. Uh, and he wrote most of the stories that today we draw from and that we know. Yeah. And that we'll be covering in this podcast. Mm-hmm. He ghost wrote for uh, other people, and most famously for Harry Houdini. He, yeah. wrote, uh, mm-hmm. he wrote a story for Harry Houdini. Uh, and he, he sold all of his stories in a, in a pulp magazine that was popular at the time called mm-hmm. Weird Tales. He didn't make a ton of money from it. I think no. at one point they offered him an editorial job on the magazine in Chicago, but he didn't move out to take it. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and eventually, at age forty-seven, he yeah he died su- uh, March fifteenth, nineteen thirty-seven. He had uh, so intestinal cancer. Intestinal cancer, and he was kind of a he was afraid of doctors, right? Of course, uh, and if it was diagnosed earlier, he might have been fine. Right. But uh, and he also had some pretty bad malnutrition, which was probably partially due to his disease and also due to his bad eating habits. He right? yeah, there's it was renowned like he he was bragging in one of his letters about how he could live on a can of beans and a loaf of bread for a week and like he just was a guy who didn't like to eat uh, which is <laughs> he's probably afraid of food. He's it? probably afraid of food. So you know there's a lot more to cover here and I think as we go through the stories we'll get a little further into HP Lovecraft's yeah. biography but those are the basic facts. One thing that I just saw on the news a couple of weeks ago is that Universal Studios is planning on doing a, a movie about H.P. Lovecraft, well, directed by Ron Howard. Yeah. And maybe a fictional accounting based on a comic book about his life. Right. right, yeah. I mean, if you've read... See, and this is one of the things that, I mean, irks me and many Lovecraft fans is where they... So, a few times, this H.P. Lovecraft character, mm-hmm. uh, who's kind of this... Um, they, they think that, like, H.P. Lovecraft himself was sort of a... a Indiana Jones type of guy that right. you know, like went out in the world and found all these old books and did all these things uh-huh. and and supposedly in that story, like I think Lovecraft is a sword and right, you know what I mean? Like as you, I think it's called the Strange Adventures of H.P. Lovecraft right. is, the, is and, the title of the comic. And H.P. Lovecraft, as if you know, looking at his history, didn't do anything like that. He right, was he was in that, his room all the time. He was not that kind of person, and and unfortunately that. That annoys me. Like, I remember okay. there was a movie. There was a movie that came out, too, which... Uh, there was a Necronomicon, the Necronomicon was movie. a movie. Yeah. Um, where Jeffrey Combs plays H.P. Lovecraft. Right. And, and he's got, like, a sword cane. Yeah, yeah. And he beat, punches some guys. And, and I can and... sort of see why that would happen, because in most of H.P. Lovecraft's stories, the protagonists were really thinly veiled versions of himself. Yes. Although they didn't get into a lot of adventures or hijinks, and there was no. nary a woman to be found. I mean, there wasn't any romance going on. No. In well. And the one one story that I can think of that there was romance, uh, it turned out to be uh, an old a woman's grandfather possessed her body right. and buried the guy. Like, <laughs> it's really horribly screwed up. Yeah. But it, and and I think that 
some fans would, uh, well, they just don't like a lot of the entertainment that's based on his work out there. Right. And there's two problems with it. One is it's some of it is so uh, intellectually horrifying that it's basically unfilmable. It's really it's, hard to make a movie. It's conceptual like. horror. Yeah, exactly. And it's a concept that is horrible, and right. you can't really film a concept. But, um, you know, From Beyond... Uh, it has a lot of nudity and sex in it. Right. That people Which say Lovecraft, of course. He was not a big fan of. No. Um, but I would argue, hey, he's a guy who shares his stuff with people, so there's no reason that you couldn't run no, off and do that. Not. Um Or some of his adaptations of his of his works are excessively gory, like Reanimator, you know, Stuart, right, another, right. another Stuart, Stuart Gordon Gordon. movie. Uh, and then you have, a, there were a lot of films, the Evil Dead series, we mentioned the Necronomicon yes. a minute ago. Um, one of the things that H.P. Lovecraft created that he shared among a lot of writers was the necronomicon which mm -hmm. was this ancient tome that would tr perhaps drive you crazy if you read it and yes was it was written by the, the mad arab who right. supposedly after he wrote the book uh, uh was ripped apart by unseen forces in the middle of a of a bazaar <laughs> like in the middle of the, of day yeah so and, it, the necronomicon is one of those things that people think actually exists because hp lovecraft you know, created it. Other writers shared it. It got yeah. mentioned in so many things that people started to think, well, this must be a real book. Yeah. But it's not. No. No, it's not a real thing. It is the reason that Ash gets in so much trouble in the Evil Dead series, however, right. is because he plays the tape recorder with well, there's a, readings. You know, we have a story about the Chad and I. Uh, when we were younger, we fell under the the this lie, if you yeah. will, that the Necronomicon was actually a real book. Right. Well, so I, I worked at the University of Illinois library system. Yes. And in the rare book room, they had a copy of the Necronomicon. Yeah. And once we saw that, it, like, our brains exploded. We're yeah. Like, I can't believe it. It's in the rare book room. Yeah, that means it's real. It's real. It's in the rare... It, it, it's... It's... You have to... You can't check it out. You have to go there and somebody brings it to you. Yeah. And it's like, oh my God. And but I what it was... It was uh, it was the Necronomicon as interpreted by yes. L. Sprague Ducamp. Is that his name? Right, right, yeah, um, Ducamps. I think I pronounce, I don't know if I pronounced that right That's or not. That's fine. But it's, yeah, I'm he, he wrote mind. it because he was in on the joke. Yeah, like, exactly. You know, and, and, and he put this out there because people like us and this mm -hmm. rumor got started that it was a real thing. And so he published this book. And, of course, it only had a small run, and that's why it was a rare book. And that's how it ended up in the rare exactly. book room. Exactly. But it was a really fun day going up to the rare book room. I felt like I... Was in a Lovecraft story. I know, yeah. Uh, so we don't have a lot of time left. Let's mention a couple other things why people might uh, maybe recognize the name of this author sure. or some of the elements in his work. Uh, I know that Metallica has a couple of... Uh, Metallica does yeah, have... Uh, they have The Thing songs. That Should Not Be is one yeah. of their songs. Call of Cthulhu actually even is, is the song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of John Carpenter's movies are influenced by H.P. Lovecraft. One yeah, very specifically is uh, Mountain, uh, Mouth, Mouth of Madness. Mouth of Madness, although there's elements of it in Prince of Darkness. Yep. And uh, even The Thing has some Lovecraft. Oh, absolutely. Uh, what else is out there? Um, the Evil Dead movies. The Evil Dead. Um, there's an episode of The Real Ghostbusters. Sure, Ghostbusters. I mean, he really... If there's anything that is science fiction... Or horror. Mm -hmm. At some point, there might, there's probably something Lovecraftian about. Well, it. yeah, a lot of you know Stephen King wrote uh, Jerusalem's Lot. Even right, mentioned the, the Necronomicon mm -hmm. in there, and um, Clive Barker in a few of his stories mentions uh, Lovecraftian gods of, of the right. Cthulhu mythos and things. And it's just one of those. It's it's part of culture like of, of horror and science fiction culture it's just yeah. interweaved in there and it's exciting to talk about and we want to talk about it more unfortunately we're running out of time for this podcast we have but what we want to tell you is that the story we're going to cover uh next time is the tomb the tomb even though uh he did write some stuff when he was younger um the, the beast in the cave when he was 15 and the alchemist when he was 18 mm -hmm. we're gonna go with the tomb i think most people acknowledge the tomb as the beginning of the hp lovecraft yeah. type of stories he yeah. wasn't he found his own voice by that point, right. and uh, and then started writing the good stuff. So, so. Re yeah, so so if you could uh, read the t read the tomb, and uh, before you listen to the next podcast, and uh, and that'll be for next time. All right. Well, I'm Chris Lackey. I'm Chad Pfeiffer, and this has been the HP Podcraft. Wait, no, no, no HP H Lovecraft. <laughs> Wait, it's it's the HP Podcraft <laughs> colon colon <laughs> the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast. Yeah, and if you and and certainly write us if you don't like that name. We're we're, we're, up, we're up to changing it. All right, signing off. Bye bye. HPPodcraft.com.